We'll start recording now, so everything's on fire, I think. What we were going to do today is just a question and answer session for all of you to ask any questions you would like. Um, it doesn't mean that I'll answer them, <laughs> or that Mary will, <laughs> but we'll give it a go. Um, they can be personal in nature or related to divine truth in any way, so, uh, or related to any questions you have about spiritual things. Um, if you have a mobile phone on, if you could please uh, switch those off because they seem to be interfering a little yesterday with some of the recording that we got. So if you could just uh, switch those mobile phones off, that would be great. Yep. Yes, Peter. Yesterday you were talking about emotions of self-deception yep. and I was wanting to ask about... Uh, prayers of self-deception and how that relates to emotions of self-deception and um, how we can uh, make our prayers um, the most um, meaningful and powerful. All right. Good question. Um, the truth is that there are prayers of self-deception. And in fact, many of us engage in these prayers quite often. <laughs> The reason why is most of our emotions of self-deception that we stay in, we start praying about. We actually start feeling like we need to work our way through these emotions of self-deception, not realising that we're deceiving ourselves while we're feeling them. And so what we do then is we start praying about them and we start uh, projecting, obviously, feelings towards God about you know, these emotions that we seem stuck in. Uh, those prayers obviously have very little effect from God's perspective God is constantly trying to answer that kind of a prayer, but, but answering it in the way of trying to show you what your self-deception is. Now, God can't usually do that directly with you while you're in a place of self-deception. So most of the time, our spirit friends who are assisting us or people around us will point things out to us or, as usual, our law of attraction will show to us that we're actually in a space of self-deception. So, yes, you can certainly have prayers of self-deception and they are when the emotions are being manufactured and are not, and are not real. You can also have intellectual prayers of self-deception where you're right in your intellect and you don't even know what you're feeling and those kind of prayers too don't get heard because all prayer needs to be based around your emotion and not around your intellect. That being said, if you have intellectual thoughts while you're praying, as long as you're connecting to those thoughts emotionally, then that obviously is a prayer. Does that make sense to everyone? So, so obviously you may be thinking thoughts as well and, and that connecting you to feelings that you're directing towards God. Now that, that is praying still. It's when you're thinking thoughts or you're having feelings that are not your real feelings and in fact are your feelings that are desires to avoid your real feelings then obviously God can't hear those prayers in the traditional sense that we would say that God automatically responds to a prayer that he can hear. But what he does is he does try to constantly expose the self-deception. So um, most of the time, like all, the entire time that I was in self-deception for nearly seven years about the issue I was crying about, I had right at the start, in fact, uh, I, I was kicking myself afterwards because right at the start, I went to this therapist who was a really intuitive type of therapist and, uh, and he told me actually that I was in self-deception. <laughs> and it took me another six and a half years <laughs> you know, to actually work it out myself. So, um, you know, he, he actually used the pendulum over the top of my uh, um, third chakra and asked me questions about whether I actually loved the woman I thought I loved. And every time I said, yes, I do, the pendulum stopped swinging. <laughs> so it was pretty obvious from the soul perspective that I actually knew even that I didn't love the woman that I thought I loved. But um, it took me another six and a half years after that to work that out. You can stay in self-deception for a long time. Yeah. <coughs> Um, we have a child who is highly allergic mm -hmm. and he was born allergic. Watching your DVDs, you touched on something about that being how we created that. Our son is seriously allergic to the point of anaphylaxis, food, nuts, substances. And um, 
it was quite shocking for me to hear that, that we created that. Yep. But I would really, really like to undo that. Yep. Can you tell me anything about it? Sure. Um, you want to mention anything first? Or? No. no? You'll let me do that? Yeah. Okay. Um, first thing, I'd like to just clarify how you've created it. It's not so much you've created, because there, there is a long list of things that have actually occurred in order for this to be created in your son. Zen, his name is, isn't it? Yes. Um, yeah, a long, a long list of things occurred, and it's a multi-generational thing that's occurred. So there's a combination of, the, of, of generational emotions from both your lineage, if you like, and your, and your partner's lineage that have, that have led to this particular creation of this group of emotions that affect Zen. And Zen's quite sensitive emotionally to lots of different areas, as you already know. And so, obviously, the more sensitive he is emotionally, the more these emotions, and if these emotions are suppressed, what happens is they come out in terms of allergic reactions. The key is to look at your own emotions in terms of what's going on inside of yourself. Um, in the past, what you've done a lot is you've tried to maintain a really good sort of positive viewpoint about life and about, and about things in general around you. And I feel that your partner does much the same thing, right? You both, you both sort of maintain a positive viewpoint about life generally. Uh, the problem with that uh, is that there is usually then a heavy suppression of your own uh, childhood emotions involved in that process. So while there is this state of sort of, you would call it a state of joy that you, that you stay in most of the time, but in, in reality it's not a real state. So it's, a, so it's an intellectually created state in order to avoid those lists of emotions that we talked about yesterday, you know, those three sets of causal emotions. The main thing that needs to happen in the, in, in the adults at this, thing, at this point is to then start just allowing the emotions to flow. Now, a lot of the emotions to, that need to flow are surrounding what your son does and are surrounding what... what you have created in your son, in the sense that when you worked out he was allergic, within a few days, I understand, of him being born, um, what emotion started passing through you at that point? Both of you is the, you, what you need to look at. And you'll find that there was some quite some suppressed emotions right at that point that started, that, that you felt. And it was those emotions that were actually creating the allerg allergic reactions in your son. Now, those emotions weren't just created by you. So in other words, um, you know, that you're not completely directly responsible for all those emotions because many of those emotions were created in you by your own parents. Does that make sense? So, yes. But if you look at it as you can now, the beauty of knowing this truth is that you have total control over its recovery. So that gives you a lot of power. So the key thing to start doing for the both of you is to start actually recognizing when you're covering one of your own emotions up. Does that make sense? Now that initially is going to take a fair bit of practice because you've spent a lot of time practicing like keeping them down and having a nice happy state. And what you'll need to do is start allowing yourself to bring those emotions up and actually feel them rather than suppressing them. In the process of suppression, he receives a lot of denied emotion from you emotions that you're currently actually quite unaware of. And it's those emotions that he's receiving that create, due to a combination of different problems in, in those emotions in terms of what they create, that is causing his, his, let's call it an illness. It's not really an illness at all. It's just the response of his soul to your soul's denial of s suppressed emotions within yourselves. So, the way to fix it is when, when you feel the feelings associated with his allergic reactions, allow yourself to go into your childlike feelings that you're denying at the time. Of Initially, there's this capping feelings of frustration and annoyance and then this, and oh, we've got to you know, change our life to suit. And fear. And fear, yeah. What, you know, what else is he allergic to and what might kill him and all of these kind of things are all there inside of you and you need to start allowing yourself to connect to those emotions. You'll find that as you connect to different ones of these emotions that you're suppressing, his allergic reactions will release. 
So you'll find that uh, maybe in a week or two's time you connect with one emotion and then you'll notice that he might no longer be allergic to nuts, for example. Do you know what I mean? And then so a month or two later you, you will connect to another emotion and all of a sudden he's not allergic to another thing. Now, if you allow that to process to occur, you'll find that he will also naturally be attracted to the foods that he'll be able to eat uh, during this process as well. So he, he will be able to at some point show you that you've actually dealt with some of your own emotional suppression. So the key thing with any childhood illness or any childhood reactions is to remember that they're all to do with the adult suppression of emotion. And, and in this case, there's a lot of linkages which you will, you will find yourself feeling about feeling controlled by the situation. So there's a lot of emotions in the both of you about feeling controlled by his allergies. And if you allow yourself to go into those emotionally, you'll actually find the source of them. If I can give you an illustration of what happened in my own life with regard to allergies as well. I was severely allergic to all grasses and pretty much pine trees and all of those kind of trees and also severely allergic to cats as well. Right? When I say severely allergic, I, I, my eyes would stream and everything would become really puff it, puffed up and, and I'd have some fairly severe reactions which would usually put me in bed for a period of time and you, most of those reactions were flu-like symptoms. Um, once I started processing a lot of them, like for example, I found that my allergy to cats was actually related to my father's hatred of cats. So whenever, whenever my father saw a cat, basically he shot it. Um, didn't matter whether it was your cat or not, <laughs> he shot it. So if it was passing through his backyard, he shot it, <laughs> right? Uh, he just uh, hates cats. And in fact, I remember one, and eventually after I processed the emotion, one event came up where we went out to a farm where this person had about 45 cats. And he shot them all, and, and, he, and I had to bury them. So I was about six at the time, and um, I was digging this grave for all of these cats and carrying them in and just, just, uh, just burying these cats that he shot. Once I'd worked through all of that emotionally, I'm now no longer allergic to cats at all. So Zen is equally allergic to cats. Sorry? Zen is, is equally allergic to cats. cats yeah. And his granddad has cats. Yep. So the key is to now look at, there, there will be emotional events in your pasts related to his allergies, specifically related to his allergies, but also related to what it's doing to you emotionally. So at the moment, there's a feeling in you that his allergies are actually controlling your life. And that's one of the emotions that you need to allow yourself both to get into. And there are a number of other of similar types of emotions about what, what is the perfect child and also your own definition of what it means to be the perfect parent. Does that make sense? There are Completely. a lot of those kind of emotions that are in amongst this allergy uh, issue with your son. Yeah, I really wanted to be the opposite of my parents. Yep. Yep. Thank you very much. Can I just add as well, don't um, fall into the trap of beating yourself up about it though, because that's because you have this thing about wanting to be a really good parent, yeah, you have the tendency then to say, oh, it's all my fault. So I think that's what has blocked me from getting to the emotions. That's it. But I feel now with what you've said that it's all going to come up. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And you will actually notice a change in him with different things as you deal with the different emotions within each of you. There, there will be emotions in each of you that need to be dealt with, not just in one, because it's actually, usually what happens is that uh, the, the genealogy of both sides, the, the, of, the, of the father and the mother that create the child, have a lot of different suppressions that have occurred, and it's the combination of the types of suppression that occur that finish up centering on the child who's born. But just on that, why would, um, like we've all got emotional suppression, mm -hmm. why would it be so extreme in our son and not so in another child? A lot of children that are very young nowadays are very, very sensitive to emotional suppression. So what's happening more and more, and you, you know you've heard of these indigo children and so forth, what's happening more and more, and this is happening f since the, from the last 40, 45 or 50 years now, the more, the more the general population deals with emotion, the more sensitive new children become when, when they incarnate. So 
So sometimes we can have a, a, a series of children even in one family where they don't have these severe reactions and all of a sudden the last child in our family has a severe reactions. And it's an indication of the fact that, that, that these children are now coming into the environment in a far more sensitive state. And, uh, and because of that, they become far more sensitive to emotions. It's actually quite a blessing. Yeah, and you'll find it later as quite a blessing because you, you will actually be able to deal with a lot of your own emotions by actually noticing his allergic reactions. Now some of the other, t other children that are like this are ones with Asperger's or, 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 or autism. Um, they have more sensitivity to the emotional suppression but they emotionally suppress within themselves. Whereas other children come out with, with different allergic reactions. There is often also spirit influences in childhood onset of different problems. So, so sometimes there is heavy spirit influence in the past in these generations. So you could have things like, and I feel this probably is happening in your family too, where you've had some parents or grandparents who have passed and great-grandparents who have passed who are taking ex ex excessive interest in Zen. But unfortunately, their own emotions are being, are being pushed upon him as well because of his emotional sensitivity. And the only way to protect him from those kind of influences are, for, for, are prayer and then you also allowing yourself to work through the emotion of why that attraction is occurring because that's also a law of attraction for the parents. So there's a lot of combination of events that actually can create a, child's, uh, a child having problems right from the time of birth. And most of those problems result not just from the parents' emotions but from spirit connections that have occurred as well. The key is to not be afraid of it but rather just to um, realise that that's occurring. You can even talk to, if you feel that there is some spirits around who, you may, who may be influencing him in some way, and sometimes you can trace this back a little. For example, um, you know, if there has been cancer in the family, then that usually means that a grandparent or a great-grandparent or someone has passed with cancer, and therefore there's a high likelihood if that parent has a really strong affiliation with a newborn child, that the child itself might get leukaemia very rapidly. So you can actually, once you see a relationship, instead of just saying, oh, we've got, we've got that problem in our family, talk to the spirits who have passed who have that problem and just tell them, look, you need to just back off from my child, <laughs> you know, and, and you know, see whether the child actually recovers. And, and you'll find in a lot of cases a child will recover. So that's something worth trying as well, just looking back through both of your uh, family trees a little and, and uh, you know, probably only need to go back three or, three or so generations and ask, ask around whether they had severe reactions to different things or not in terms of their emotional setup as well. So if you do a combination of those things, I'm sure you'll find his, uh, his, his condition will improve quite rapidly. What if it's reversed and you feel yeah, up nice sorry? Um, what if you feel guilty? <laughs> I feel that it's my fault that <laughs> Renee's sick, <laughs> and I feel like I've got to look after her or. I know that it's not my fault that she did all those things to me, but I still feel like I have a responsibility that... Yeah. Can you explain to everyone who Renee is? <laughs> She's my um, biological mother. Okay, good. And I just went to see her and she just looks... <laughs> and, and, and what is she suffering from, Morgan? Um... MS yeah. and you know her balance is off and her eyesight and you know she's saying that she you know gonna end up in a wheelchair and stuff like that and yeah <laughs> so you're feeling feelings of like that it must be your fault somehow right so we need to talk about that you want to talk about that no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting fueled a lot today it's like <laughs> The, the truth is, Morgan, that it's not your fault. Um, 
all, parent, all diseases are created by the suppression of emotions within yourself. And the only exception to that is a disease that's created in a child, which is the suppression of emotions in the parents. But the child can't suppress their emotions and then create a disease in the parent. So it's totally impossible for you to have created her disease in any way from a, from a purely truth point of perspective. However, you feel terrible feelings of guilt and you do feel like you have created it in some way when, or are responsible for it. And the reason why is because they have taught you to take complete responsibility for everything that's happened to them in their lives, your parents I'm talking about. And that is one of the most severest emotional distresses that any parent can cause their child. And that is that they make the child completely responsible for all of their life. And this is one of the things emotionally that you will need to come to recognize the truth about at some point. And that is that you are not at all responsible for your parents' life, no matter what they told you. A good book to read about that, and it would be very, very, very helpful to for you to read this book. It's called Toxic Parents, and um, I think it's by Dr. Susan For Forward. Um, and in there it talks about, and, and Dr. Susan Forward is very, very direct. She wrote the book, I think, in the 70s or 60s, and she was very, very direct and honest about parents, parents impression of emotion upon children and the kind of things that they do towards children to convince children that they are at fault. And it would be very helpful for you to have a read through that and let yourself connect to some of the examples in the book and, and, and cry about the fact that you've had these projections. But the truth is you are not responsible for anything your parents are experiencing. Um, just at the moment you, you're stuck in these feelings of guilt and responsibility. My advice is just to pray about accepting the truth about the situation, which is what AJ's just told you. Because at the moment that's hard for you to connect to emotionally because you're stuck up in this guilt. If you pray about that, you'll find there's a lot of grief in there for you about this awful feeling from when you're really little that I'm, I'm responsible for everything and what that felt like for you. It was quite oppressive. So some of this guilt is actually childhood emotion, but some of the guilt is of your own creation. And so it's an emotion of self-deception for you. The reason why you're staying in the guilt is because it's more preferable than feeling that your mum and dad don't love you. Does that make sense? And we've had a talk about that a few times. It's a big emotion for you. So if you allow yourself just to grieve the fact that they don't love you, because that's what you truly feel inside of you. Um, rather than going into guilt and, say, and feeling that it's actually your fault that they don't love you. Because what they told you was it's your fault that they don't love you, but actually that's not true. It's what they have going on inside of them emotionally that causes them to not love you. Yeah. That's it. Any other questions? Um, Louise? Um. AJ, I had a rebirthing and, um, years ago and I felt really unloved in the moments of my birth. Yep. And um, I have two daughters who are 21 and 29 and my older daughter feels unloved by me. Mm. And um, so I'm wondering what the projections of my parents onto me were and what my projections onto my daughters, especially my older daughter, are. Yep. Would you like to know how the emotions are created in your children or would you like to know how they were created in you or would you like to know how to release it all? <laughs> or would you like to know all of those things? <laughs> all of it if it doesn't okay. take too long. <laughs> your mother in particular has a very, very poor opinion of herself. And um, when, whenever anybody who gives birth to a child has a very, very poor opinion of herself or himself, uh, if it's a male involved, you know, like in the, in, the parent, in the parenting situation. What happens to the child is the child is not loved. The reason why is because when the parent feels terribly unloved themselves, the child is born with a, usually a role to play, and that is the child has to give out the love. That's generally what the child is forced into doing emotionally in order to receive any approval. And this is something that's driven your life a lot, this desire 
to, to get approval from everyone around you, but particularly you know, to excel in order to get love. And so what happens in that situation is that the parent's emotion of being unloved means that the parent does not actually love the child. Now, what I'm saying does not love the child, the parent <coughs> thinks they love the child most of the time. But the actual emotion of love is not exiting the parent and going into the child. Does that make sense? So because the emotion of love is not coming out of the parent and going into the child, the child's not receiving the emotion of love right from the time, in, in, right through the pregnancy and also at the birth. So what happens then is the child grows up feeling unloved and feeling it needs to earn love, right? which is what, something that you've grown up with all of your life. Now when that child is an adult and gives birth to a child, what happens there is the same kind of event occurs again. By the time the, 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 the original child was an adult and is ready to have an, a child of her own, she is now in a state where she really feels usually quite strongly, quite strongly unloved. And, and so therefore is not in a space to actually give the emotion of love to the child. Does that make sense? And so the whole cycle then perpetuates again. And the other thing that occurs is when we do not love ourselves, the child also learns that it cannot love itself. Does that make sense? So often what happens, and you see this happen a lot with women where they feel emotions of unworthiness, they grow up as an adult, they then have a child, but they're feeling emotions of unworthiness themselves and emotions that they are unloved themselves. And when they're in that state, um, they often do not act in harmony with love of self. So in other words, most women, when they, by the time they get to be a mother, they believe to be a good mother, you've got to do everything for everyone around you. You've got to be the good wife who does all the cooking and all the cleaning. You've got to go out and have a job nowadays as well because that's also necessary. And then you've also got to be really good at that and you've got to develop your intellect and you've got to do this and you've got to do all of these different things with your children and get off the school and get and home. And there's all these different things that you start juggling as a, as a woman, right? But the problem is that you're giving out all of this stuff and there's, no, you, there's not even a sense of love of self in all of that. So, and how many of you as, as wives have always believed that as soon as you do something for yourself, you've been quite selfish? Like, yeah, see, it's a very common emotion. All right, so, so what happens then is the child, if it's the same gender child, will often feel terrible feelings, not only of the fact that it didn't receive the love, but also that, that it has a terrible viewpoint towards itself, which mirrors its mother's viewpoint towards itself. Now, if you had had a boy in the system, you'd probably find, Anna, do you have any sons? No, two. two girls. If you had had a boy, you would find that actually the boy would probably feel more loved than the girls. Well, I know my mother, boy and brother. Exactly. Well, the reason why is because um, there was a lot of negative emotions she had towards herself as a woman. And so any daughter she has will also have a lot of negative emotions towards herself as a woman. But if she has a male child, they're not women. They're not girls. And so therefore that particular emotion doesn't get absorbed by them. Does that make sense? And so that's why you can have even just in the one family, one gender being loved and the other gender being feeling unloved even though the parent seems to outwardly treat them both the same. She seemed to love my sisters the one who died. Yep. There's also things that goes on with each parent in terms of if you can yeah, use a mic. There's also things that go on with the parents in every situation at different time frames. So it, a lot of times we can be, and, and this is where a lot of the so-called hidden things that occur in a family, like the, the things that everyone, you know, the skeletons in the closet, you know, things like, I've seen this happen over and over again where in the past there might have been, mum might have had a brief affair or dad might have had a brief affair during that time or something like that, and, and just you reminding them of that time reminds them of that emotion that they're yet to release. Does that make sense? And so you can have the same, even the same gender children being treated completely different just because of the events that occurred that reminds the parents at that, at that moment what kind of emotion that was painful to them that they don't want to experience. So this is why it's very, very 
it's very important you don't judge yourself or any of the interactions of emotions by your siblings or by you know your your environment because everything is very very specifically oriented around events affecting your own life which are unique in the entire history of the world let alone the world right now and so the key thing to understand is to allow yourself to see that that even though your siblings may have been treated one way it doesn't mean that there is a logical reason in your parents mind as to why you've been treated differently and what often we're doing as adults is we're trying to search for a logical reasons of why we've been treated a certain way rather than actually connecting with the emotion of the fact that we feel we were treated completely differently and we need to trust that and work with that emotionally does that make sense now our parents will often try to convince us otherwise if we discuss that with them so when I if, if you go to your parent and say like why did you treat my brothers and sisters like better than me they'll probably say no I didn't you know no I never did that and and because they're in denial of many of the suppressed emotions that occurred during your life right from the time you they, your mum was pregnant with you right the way through your life which were not the same kind of emotional suppressions that occurred in other situations with others of your siblings so most parents at some point need to come to terms with that so this is even why your two daughters are different in their interaction with you does that make sense your first daughter which is your oldest daughter is the one who feels the most unloved and and the reason why is because when you had her you felt more unloved than w when you did have the second child does that make sense and so that's the reason why she has this feeling now I know inside of you you believe you loved both your daughters exactly the same but the truth is it's very very difficult to do that while I hold on to while I hold on to different emotions about myself being unloved and also about myself being a woman in your case with different set of emotions about what you should be doing and so forth and so can you see even just with your own children you can feel that you love them the same but actually the emotions of love that enter them will be very different depending on the events that were occurring in your own life does that make sense yeah. and my older daughter threw a lot of tantrums up until the age of three and my father was verbally violent so I projected like a lot of distaste about that anger yeah. that my daughter was probably expressing that was my stuff that's correct it was your stuff what happened during that stage was that you you had a lot of fear about violence and a lot of fear about your daughter was obviously quite sensitive to that so she was just reflecting that back at you and instead of at the time you dealing with that and saying emotionally saying oh, I've just got fear of violence I've got fear of being controlled by you know by by anger and so forth and instead of just going into those things emotionally because you didn't know how to do that at the time what you did was then you just put a bit of extra blame on her and 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 what that does is cause her to feel more unloved mm. does that make sense so the key is to allow yourself to go back to those emotions that created the situations with your daughter with your oldest daughter and allow yourself to deal with some of these things about violence and about fear that you have and so forth and as you release them you'll actually find your daughter's feelings even though she's adult will change towards you automatically you don't have to verbally make them change all you need to do is deal with the emotions in you that created her current condition and when you do that you'll find she will automatically change towards you does that make sense and some of you have already experienced that right I think you've experienced that Helga with your son again and again where you've worked through different emotion all of a sudden he's he's being quite different towards you so he, and this is your son's how, how old 42 so like so you, know, you can see that it doesn't really matter what age uh, these things are occurring at if as an adult we start owning some of these emotions and dealing with the causal of them um, rather than sort of getting into a bun fight with our child about why they're treating us a certain way or rather than feeling sad that they're treating us this way if we get underneath those capping emotions or those self-deception emotions and into the actual cause and one of these causes is your in fact your relationship with your father um, you would actually release that emotion and you'll notice a change in your daughter even though she's 28 I think you said mm. okay thank you no worries there's a question about parenting that someone sent in did you oh, want yes. to go with well, that, we'll while, cover we're that while we're at it shall we well, I'll read it to you yeah yeah let's read it 
Uh, it can be difficult to see how to remain truthful to oneself and others when one simultaneously tries to juggle following one's passion with being the perfect caretaker of one's children. I can see once a person is at one then there would be no issues in that one's children would be completely okay with all your desires anyway. But until then it is hard to believe that there will never be even a small element of self-sacrifice in child rearing. You might argue that if a person truly wanted and loved the child then it would not even ever feel like self-sacrifice. But the fact is that some people only believe that they want the child and only believe they love them when in reality they only wanted someone to love themselves. So for those people what is the way forward? To prioritise? First, f first perfect the caretaking and then follow the passion? Okay. Perfect the caretaking and follow, then follow the passion. You cannot perfect your parenting until you deal with the emotional causes as to why it's not perfect. So no matter what physical actions you take towards your children, nothing will change or things will change very little until you actually have an emotion connected with those actions. Or you release the emotion that prevents actions of love towards the children. So if we look at should we learn how to caretake our children, my feelings are, no, we need to firstly learn how to release our own emotions that cause them to feel like they're not cared for. Does that make sense? Then secondly, the question is, what about self-sacrifice with child rearing? If you have a feeling that you are sacrificing yourself for your children, then you need to work through the underlying emotional causes as to why you feel that feeling. Now, many of us do feel that feeling, right, when we're parenting. Because, you know, our life severely changes generally when we first have the, our first child and we don't seem to get back the life that we ever had ever again for many of us or by the time they're all grown up and gone away and even then a lot of our life is very, very different. So a lot of us then feel that we've sacrificed ourselves. Well, that is again a childhood emotion within ourselves that was being triggered by, the child com by our own child coming into our life. My suggestion is in each case that what we try to do often when a lot of people have been asking questions of us um, saying, well, we don't live in a perfect world, so can we make some compromises? <laughs> um, from God's perspective, every time you make a compromise, you create an imperfect world. <coughs> Does that make sense to everyone? So every time you compromise a truth or compromise how you do things with your child, you are creating an imperfect world automatically. It doesn't matter what your intentions were in your mind, if your feelings are down a certain path and you're denying certain feelings and not expressing feelings and not expressing truth and not living in truth, not living the principles of divine truth in other words, what happens is it automatically creates the negative or the karmic negative consequences upon our own life and, and also upon our children's life. So stop thinking along the lines of Oh, I've got to compromise until I'm at one with God. Does that make sense? Stop compromising and you'll find your life will change a lot more rapidly. So with regard to parenting, that applies. Stop compromising. Look very, very consistently at your own emotions. So if you're feeling controlled by your child, feel the emotion. Feel the emotion. Your child wants to control you because you have an emotion of allowing control. So feel those emotions, connect with the causal emotions and release it. Th part of that is going to be going through an emotion in the example I've given of saying in the end, oh, no to the child. Like, no, actually you can't have what you demand of me. You can do whatever you want in your own life, but as soon as you're demanding things of me, now it's my free will being impacted. Does that make sense? So, for example, I could be pushing a trolley down the uh, shopping centre and the child wants a heap of lollies. Now, whose free will is being impacted if I don't get them? You see, if the child's four years of age wanting the lollies and I get them the lollies, but, it, but I'm doing it out of harmony with my love of self, in other words, I don't agree with my own choice, I'm only doing it to placate the child or to give the child a treat that I don't feel the child should have, or whatever reason's going on within me, I'm not being honest, 
And whose money is it that's being used to pay for these lollies? Mine. Does that make sense? So my own free will is now being impacted by the child's demand. And, what, and why is it being impacted? Maybe that if I don't give them the lollies, they have a big cry in the supermarket and I just want to avoid the emotion of having every person in the supermarket project <laughs> anger or upset at me because of my child having a tantrum. Does that make sense? For not getting what it wants. Which is actually the causal emotion I need to release. Does that make sense? The causal emotion is I'm able to be controlled by someone going into a tantrum. And I need to release that emotion that comes from my own childhood. So while when we ask any questions about parenting, if you look at it from a purely divine love and divine truth perspective and, and stop compromising those truths for the sake of short-term gains, which actually cause quite long-term problems, then you'll find you'll have a lot better results with your children. Uh, I was just going to add, though, that um, also the converse is true. If I if I want if I just feel I'm sacrificing myself because I want to go out clubbing and I've got a two year old at home, mm. that's clearly out of harmony with love of the child. Mm. And really, the causal emotion I need to process then is what you were referring to in the beginning. This is the law of attraction for me to feel about not having my own desires or whatever myself as a child. Mm. Yeah. And I, I, I don't have the same traditional feelings about having children as what the majority of you will have. In the spirit world, most children are looked after by people who are not their parents. Now, I'm not suggesting that's the best solution here, because actually a good, the good solution here is actually for the parents to look after their children and deal with their emotions <laughs> in the process. That's the best solution. But what I'm saying is that uh, should a parent not be dealing with a child in, a, in a, an appropriate manner, in a loving manner, and, and they don't seem to be able to consistently or uh, deal with the emotion or have a desire to deal with the emotion, then I don't see any harm in that parent giving the child to a person who can love the child. Does that make sense? Without judgment. But the majority of us have a lot of judgment about that because society has a lot of judgment about that. Does that make sense? My suggestion, though, is that children are your best law of attraction. Your children are going to lead you to God faster than I can lead you, faster than anybody else can lead you, right? Because they are a complete reflection of every single individual emotion within yourself that you're denying. So if you can see it that way, you can see your children as a very, very powerful assistance to you, right? They are really God's blessing to you to help you get to God. And that's the way I also see children. Is there any other questions? Okay, uh, if we just come to Brian in front of you, yeah, just there, and then we'll come to Raya, and then we'll go up the back. Um, AJ, I'm a slow learner too, and I'm confused about the new birth. Can you explain the new birth to me, please? The new birth? The new birth is when the soul has made its complete transition of at one moment into God's, into God's love. The transition occurs between the seventh and the eighth sphere of the spirit world. There is a description of the new birth uh, in the channeled material called the, the Gate of Heaven by Robert James Lees, which is actually on the CD material that many of you have. Um, in terms of how it's experienced by a spirit. The new birth is the culmination of a transformation of the soul that begins the moment you start receiving divine love and, and completes as a process the moment you know you are feeling God's love 100% of the time. So between when you first start receiving divine love, which would begin, that you, you can begin any time, whether you're in the sixth sphere in terms of condition, whether you're here on earth or in the spirit world, doesn't matter. And it can begin right from the first sphere in condition, right from one of the hells in condition, you can start receiving divine love. You could say at the beginning you have 0% of divine love in you. And then as you start receiving divine love, you get 1%, 2%, 3%, and 4%, 5% of the time I'm now receiving it, 10% of the time I'm now receiving it, and so forth. And then obviously as I'm releasing emotional blockages towards receiving divine love, my ability to receive divine love grows as I'm releasing these different emotions. 
So you can think of all the emotions as blocks or us saying no to God. And the less we say no to God, the higher percentage of time we're going to be receiving love. When you make the transition into receiving love 100% of the time, you are said to, to have had the experience of the new birth. The soul also has been transformed by that process into a different type of soul. It has all different types of sh chakras, even energy points in the spirit body is completely different. And you have the ability now to experience divine love entering you all the time without, without let up. Is this when we're a fat soul? This is when you're a fat soul, yeah. Right. <laughs> Remember I described a fat soul. So the soul is now transformed. It doesn't mean that, that the soul's uh, process of transformation has stopped because obviously as you're receiving the divine love, it's an, it, it continues infinitely. But at that moment, you have received divine love 100% of the time. And now a lot of your transformation is about truth. And so this is why learning on earth to seek truth is such an important thing. And in fact, this is why it's one of the first lessons you learn on the path of divine love is to get into that state of wanting and desiring the truth 100% of the time. Because when you get into a state of at one moment with God and the eighth sphere and have experienced the new birth, which is the transformation of the soul into this new soul with whole new capacity, the soul has new capacity to do lots of different things that it didn't have before, once you re get to that state, you will still have a desire to receive more love and, and more truth and the soul's capacity to grow will just continue to increase. But, but it's the new birth or the transformation of the soul between the seventh and the eighth sphere that is the, really the point where you now become also happy 100% of the time. From then on, there are no negative emotions only positive emotions, all emotions pass through you. Every event that you would now believe is negative, you don't see as negative at all, you just feel in joy about every event. And so that's the state of, that you'll feel after the new birth has occurred. Does that correspond with that moment? Can we have a mic? Because uh, otherwise the recording systems don't get it. So. Does that correspond with that one minute? Yes, it does. So the new birth, the transition of, or the new birth, when, and the reason why I called it the new birth was because in the first century, I was trying to describe to people that the fact that the soul was being born again. So the, the soul before, when it was first born, if you like, into the flesh, it was born into a state where the higher state it could become is a sixth year state. Does that make sense? So the higher state it can become is perfected in natural love. That's the highest state the soul could become. But when the soul goes through the transformation of the new birth, the, now the highest state of the soul is infinite in nature. It also means that the soul at this point is, is immortal. It cannot ever die because it's got God's love in it. And also it's been transformed in its nature to such a point that now it's divine in nature and not human in nature. So every so-called angel in the spirit world, which are all the spirits above the seventh sphere, eighth sphere and above, in other words, they've all been transformed by divine love to such an extent that they are now divine in nature. So before that time, your soul has still got human nature. After that soul, you could say, after that transformation, you could say your soul has now got divine nature. And that divine nature is reflected 100% of the time in all dealings. And that's, that's the condition of at one moment or the, or the experience of the new birth. The reason why I called it a new birth is because the experience I had in the first century, and if you read that book that I mentioned, the experience that is noted in there, it's actually, there's actually this feeling that you're a totally different person in a lot of ways. And you have totally different capacities to do all sorts of things that you could never do before. And you have also, at that point, uh, you start to understand the difference between time and space. And so you, have, you are not bound by limitations of time and space anymore uh, upon this transformation. So besides there being a lot of love-based things that have happened to your soul and a lot of emotional things that have happened to your soul, there is also a lot of very technical and scientific things that have happened to the soul during the transformation. And you actually feel them happen during the transformation and that's why I called it a new birth. It was just like being born the first time in that there was 
there was this new experience beginning and when you experience the new birth there's another completely new experience beginning. The time between now and the new birth is like this time, you could call it a time of preparation or probation even, uh, where you're learning to become a divine soul and it's the receiving of divine love that causes you to get to that place. So no six fear spirit in the spirit world has ever experienced it and yet many of them believe they have but they don't, they've not experienced it and, uh, and only when they receive divine love to the point of that transition will they truly experience that transition. There's a lot of Paget messages that are worth reading of spirits who made that transition from the natural love path to the divine love path. And you know, there's even messages in there from Aristotle and Plato and different ones like that who historically are renowned for their philosophy but they lived in a six fear state and then they learned about the divine love state and made these transitions of the soul which is into a completely different state. Um, who was next? I think Raya was next uh, down the front here, Pete. Hi, Hey, Jay. How you doing? Um, last Sunday, uh, I came up and talked to you and found out about my incredible uh, control issues. They were just like exploding onto the surface. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went home that night and feeling very pressured and all the next day. And um, it was toward evening when we went in our room to relax and I could just feel I was just smoldering and I could feel all this rage coming up mm -hmm. and I was, Brian was there and I'm going, look at that, you're the only moving thing. It's like I, I don't want to direct this at you. And then I started addressing, feeling like I'd lost my connection with God because of all of the new age levels that I've been so enmeshed in for so long. Mm -hmm. And there was an incredible amount of grief that came up with that. And then I don't know what happened. The whole thing just like the floodgates just opened. And um, it was an amazing experience what happened. And I, I actually felt like I was going through a birthing process while that was happening. And while I was crying, which went on for two hours just constantly, there was this little wailing sound. And I felt like uh, this baby literally was coming out. And, uh, and I kept telling Brian, I can't breathe in here. I can't breathe. And then all these pictures from childhood and all, all this stuff came up, which, mm -hmm. you know, is kind of what so many of us have discovered uh, and experienced. But um, anyway, this all went on for quite a while. And then I finally, we had some dinner and I went to sleep. But I couldn't get out of bed or move for two days mm -hmm. at all. Yep. And I was traumatized the next day. I couldn't eat, mm -hmm. which was probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I wanted to ask you to talk to us a little bit about what happens with the body mm -hmm. uh, when these things are going on. And I, I felt like there was, um, I literally could feel stuff like crawling around in my head, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I mean, I, and my intelligence was coming up with all kinds of things, but I want to hear what mm -hmm. you guys have to say about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nice. I was talking to Ray about it a bit before we started and saying that that often happens with me that if I, I have a big release I'm suddenly I need to sleep it's like I need to um, assimilate everything that's just changed within me mm. and I know you've had that experience of sleeping for very long periods after processing. Yeah um, what happens to the spirit and material bodies is that the, em the emotions cause lots of damage to both of your bodies so all the held emotions, and for you it's been held for 50 or 60 years or so, so you know, you've got quite a lot of held emotions in there, held there from childhood to a long time. That does a lot of damage to the body. And it's a bit like uh, when you try to hold a muscle in a certain contracted state. If you, you can do it in f a few seconds, but you try and hold a fist in a contracted state for a minute and you start feeling the pain start welling up, don't you? And then if you've tried doing it for 10 minutes, like you get to a point even where you can't even feel your arm anymore if you do it. And, uh, and you think about that, that's what's really happening to your bodies as well. Your body, all of your cells in both bodies, your, both bodies have genetic structure, both your spirit body and your material body, they're just in different dimensional spaces. <coughs> and they both have uh, genetic structure. 
And those genetic structures are very much influenced by the emotions in the soul. This is why when you read the Paget messages, you know, they talk about someone in a good soul condition, they can see a very bright body. The body is a reflection of the soul's condition. So, so it, particularly the spirit body. So what happens is when you release an emotion, all of these, all of the emotions have held in all of these toxins and all of these other problems, the physical problems in both bodies. And then you'll go through a process where all of these toxins and everything just start releasing to start releasing over a period of time. Now, the body, the physical body, is the slowest body to respond to the soul's change. The spirit body responds quite quickly to the soul's change. So a lot of times what happens with the spirit body, within a few hours or a day or two, these new energy pathways are now open, and so the, the spirit body repairs itself quite rapidly from the damage that had been done to it by holding in the emotion. The, spirit, the material body, though, is a little slower in that uh, many of its replication, cell replication processes take anywhere up to seven years to, to occur. So what happens with the cell replication process in the material body is that now the emotion's been released, all of the emotions that affected this replication process in the body, including what happens in the brain in terms of its wiring structure, everything that's happening in the body in terms of physiologically, how the body actually repairs itself, and all of those different things are all controlled by the emotion. And so when the emotion is released, now the body is free to actually make these adjustments. But because of that, the initial influx is usually toxins and everything starting to come out of your body. And that, obviously, your physical body also needs to rest during this process. So you often go, after releasing a causal emotion of any type, you'll often feel like resting and sleeping. And, uh, in fact, just let your body do its thing. Um, now, that's a bit hard for many of us if we're working or something like that, because the next day might be you're right off and we're dragging ourselves around when really the body needs to be resting. And all that means is that the body will take longer to recover, the physical body. It will recover, though, because the emotion's been released and it's the emotion that caused it to not recover. So as soon as the emotion's gone, the body will recover. It just will take a little longer if you don't let yourself rest, you know, um, straight, away, straight after the release. I remember saying to Brian, thank God I don't have to go to work. I couldn't have gotten off that bed. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people experience that, and it's a really good sign you've released some causal emotion. And so just let the body do its recovery process. And uh, I've had to do that uh, many, many times, sometimes even up to periods of two weeks, um, where I've had to rest every day or have a sleep in the afternoon every day because I just, my body just was uh, not, not coping with the changes, that I, the, the speed of the changes I was making at the soul level. So your body will take time to recover. Some people uh, in, the, in the New Age philosophies call it sort of like a rewiring of the brain or a rewiring of your system, or they also have the terminologies of the release of genetic imprints upon the cells and all those kind of things. Well, in reality, what's happening is the emotion from the soul dominates both bodies and determines the condition of both bodies. So when you release an emotion from the soul, your bodies will recover. Now, many of you have noticed this in different areas. For example, some of you will have noticed that um, you might be overweight and you release a certain emotion and then all of a sudden the weight just starts dropping off you and you haven't eaten any differently, for example. That's because the emotion that created you holding on to the weight has been released and so the body automatically, physically recovers. So just allow the body to do its thing without oh too much judgment. Yeah. yeah. Um, can we, there was somebody else who had their hand right up the back. Lisa, that's right. Um, uh, maybe before I just answer your question, Lisa, there is a question in my list here about rewiring there's a question about rewiring the there the, there it is there so there it is yeah. rewiring <laughs> yeah you can read it. yeah, yeah. Um, have you uh, do you want me to? Uh, uh, this person's referring to a book called the pathway by laurel mellon excellent emotional processing book in it she explains how necessary it is to feel all one's emotions and goes into great detail as to how to she also says that we need to learn equally to feel happiness joy etc as many of us are not good at that either i.e we deny the good and the bad we deny both the good and the bad feelings she says that it 
it isn't enough to only feel the negative and leave it at that. Our brains need rewiring and we need to consciously choose to feel good afterwards to wire our brains for joy. What do you say about that? Do you feel we need to wire for joy or just pray for divine love? Good question. Um, the, the truth is that um, it, how we act at the childhood level is always the way we're headed. So if you think about a child, a child doesn't try to rewire its brain for joy. A child just experiences joy when it's there. Does that make sense? A child doesn't also have to practice in terms of getting into a negative emotion. The child just gets into the negative emotion as soon as it's there. That's the state you will be in when you become closer and closer to fully experiencing and choosing your, all of your emotions. So while it may sound clever to actually rewire the brain for something, it's actually a very natural love thing that you can do. That being said, there are truths that you will experience after you've released negative emotions that you will need to come to accept. And many of us are very, very resistive to accepting truths because of different emotions that exist in with us. So, for example, let's say I've uh, released a certain emotion that was related to a childhood experience where my father punished me for something and so I now believed I was bad. Once I've released that emotional experience, I may no longer believe I'm bad, but it doesn't automatically follow that I believe I'm good. Does that make sense? To believe I'm good, I will have to actually have some love enter me, which, by the way, if I long for love in that situation after releasing the emotion, I would certainly receive it. And in that love process entering me, what will happen is that the, that divine love will show me actually that I'm good, if that makes sense to you. So, so what's actually happening is, um, there's not just the process, and, I, and I've, I've reminded a lot of people about this over the last five or six years, that it's not just the process of releasing negative emotion. There's also a process of learning to experience positive emotion. In other words, learning to experience your desires. Right? And uh, many of us have severely shut down our desires through the expression of negative emotion, uh, or through the holding of negative emotion, when we release the negative emotion, in a way we're sort of blank. We're not yet developing our desire. So my suggestion to you is besides going through a process of releasing negative emotion, also begin developing your desires concurrently. Do you follow me? So this requires you sitting down and actually, what do I really want? What do I really desire? And then actually beginning to live in these desires. Now, as you do that, what you're doing is you're growing another part of your soul. You're growing the part of your soul that's being quite suppressed through emotion, which is the part of your soul that y you will need to actually, in the end, live in constantly. And that's the desirous part, the passionate part of your soul, if that makes sense to everyone. So my suggestion, besides just releasing negative emotion, is to start looking at all the things you desire and start doing them. When, they're not harmonious, when they are harmonious with love. And if you find it hard to connect with what your desires are, then there's an emotion covering that. So there's going to be something in your childhood about, I'm not allowed to have my desires. So really focusing on, what, why don't I, why aren't I allowed to have my desires? What do I feel about having my own desires? Mm. Am I selfish? Am I going to get in trouble? All of those sorts of things. Yeah. Does that make sense to everyone? Look. So, so if you allow yourself to do that, what will happen is the so-called rewiring of your brain will automatically occur. Remember, everything that's happening in your bodies, both the spirit body and the material body, are a complete reflection of what is in the soul. So all you need to focus on is changing your soul and your bodies will automatically change. You will grow younger in appearance, you will lose the weight you're carrying or if, you've lo if you feel quite skeletal, you'll start putting on a bit of weight so that it's like your body starts maintaining itself properly. Everything will automatically happen as you deal with the emotions. If it doesn't happen, then the emotion hasn't been dealt with. Does that make sense? So let the emotion be dealt with, then it will happen. And so rather than being very body-centric, which a lot of New Age practices are very body-centric, and forget about the body for a while, focus on the soul, 
and notice the changes in your body as a result. And you'll find your body changes a lot more rapidly than if you do the physical things. The soul's the, the perfect creation and the other bits are just the, the add-ons. Yeah. If we work on that, everything will get better. Yeah. It's really, it's really beautiful to watch actually when you see it happening like in, to yourself. Like for years and years and years I really struggled to put on weight. In fact, for some time what I tried to do is do sort of the bodybuilding thing, you know, which was have six meals a day, four of them of meat um, or, or protein, and I'd do my weight, weight training rigorously uh, for four to, four to five days a week. I finished on putting, up, putting on a little bit of weight and, and a little bit of fat as well. <laughs> and, uh, and in the end, I felt quite terrible. I couldn't go to the loo properly. Um, and, uh, and my body was just a mess, right? And, and I didn't look too bad, but, uh, but everything else wasn't running too good. Um, and I just found it a huge struggle to even keep my weight. So as, if I just stopped doing that for a day or two, the net, I would lose two or three or four kilograms. Like, and then I, it would take me another two months to get that weight back again, you know. And after I'd be so, like I'd be really, really upset and frustrated with my body and what's wrong with me. These other guys can go down the gym three days a week and eat crappy diets and they can put on weight and I can't and all this kind of stuff went through me emotionally. What I've realised now, and now I eat on the average around two meals a day. Um, I just have some fruit usually up until lunch and then uh, usually myself and Mary have a meal around four or five in the afternoon. And we eat uh, mostly all natural food, so all just raw, ve vegan type food, unprocessed. And I have, we have very little, uh, very small meals generally compared to what most people would have. And I'm actually putting on weight. So I went from eating six meals a day, losing weight, to, to eating two meals a day, only, no, w w the only protein I have nut is nuts, uh, and putting on weight. So, so how did that happen? It's happened because I've started releasing a lot of the emotions of unworthiness about, you know, and, and how I look. I've been releasing a fair bit of emotions about being upset with how I look and so forth. And once I've released all those things I'm putting on the weight and uh, how I look is very very different to how I look in the spirit world right so when you understand the difference between how I look there and now you'll understand why I have some grief about it <laughs> <laughs> so anyway I think you're gorgeous. she thinks I'm gorgeous now <laughs> Okay, Lisa, thanks. I'm wondering if you could help me um, work out the emotion of why I didn't want to breastfeed my children when I had, even so in the medical world, I just didn't even try, didn't want to. Um, and does that have an effect on your children when you don't do that? Yes, it does have an effect on your children. Um, what, rather than me tell you what it is, would you like to feel what you feel about your breasts. Oh, okay. <laughs> don't me feel them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't mean feel them. Actually, I mean. <laughs> actually, sitting here has been a really good thing because I'm totally aching all across the chest area. Okay. Yeah. And, and Tate came up to me and said, oh, don't cry, Mum. <laughs> okay. So yeah. there's some sadness in there that uh, you experienced about having children. And if you allow yourself to connect to that sadness, you will start understanding why you didn't want to breastfeed them. Why well, I didn't want to have children, like I planned my children. What, what In my mind, I did. What, yeah. yeah, what would children do to your life? And how old were you when you began having them? <laughs> and I was 18 when I started having children. Yeah. And how yeah. did it feel to you? I, I loved it. Yeah. That, I felt that was what my job was. Right. My role in this life was to have children. It didn't worry me about what I would miss out or if I didn't travel or anything. Can that you see lots of self-denial there? No, I can't see it, no, because yeah. I've never sort of craved that type of life, like I'm happy with my children. It's because you're unprepared to live your own life. And there's an emotion in there that you can't have your own life, in fact. 
There's a big, big emotion that comes from your mother about what defines a woman. And having children is one of the major things that defines a woman for you. Does that make sense? But there is also a resistance to that emotion, hence the desire to not breastfeed. And th yes, it does have an effect on the children. But it's not so much the breastfeeding or not breastfeeding that has the effect on the child, it's the emotion that creates the desire to yeah. not breastfeed that has the effect. Well, I've never thought about it until recently when I've yeah. started trying to work out why I chose to have the children when I did yeah. and what reason I wanted to fall pregnant. Yeah. yeah. So I you need to look a lot more deeply at some of those emotions because you'll find quite a lot of stuff about self-denial in there. There's these uh, viewpoints or the, the feelings that you have about how bad you are yourself. Will, you'll find a lot of things of truth in there for you. Yeah. And Lisa, isn't it true that you, you find it really hard to connect to your desires sometimes you, and you get a bit indecisive and, oh, what do I really want? What do I, you know? Yeah, with some things majorly. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 I um, lived in so much error and made quite a few mistakes that I just don't want to do the mistakes anymore. So just that's a big fear, though. Yeah. Can you hear? Yeah. yeah. So and, and that's actually a fur fear emotion, that one. I that, one? That, that one's a self deception, self -deception. emotion. Uh, I call them a furphy uh, <laughs> in our private life. <laughs> um, the furphy emotion of, is one of like, like um, that you feel you've done mistakes in the past so you feel a bit confused in the future when you make decisions because you don't want to make mistakes again. Yeah, because I don't know if I'm stepping back into the error or am I um, going back to feel the emotion that I missed? Because we don't know. Cause You've got to take yourself out of an unloving relationship, don't you? But am I just running from that or am I denying the emotion? Well, the act of taking yourself out of an unloving relationship certainly is an imp improvement than staying in the relationship yeah. and being abused. Mm -hmm. so, so that's certainly an improvement and that means that you are growing in self-love. Yeah. Yeah. But there is an um, underlying emotional reason related to your father in, this particular, in that particular case of, as to why you feel so bad as a woman in a relationship and why it attracts such negative treatment in the relationship. And that emotion is the emotion you need to be able to get into and deal with. Now you've dealt with a little bit of that in times in the past, but it's such a big emotion. And this is just a comment for, our, for everyone about parental emotions. We often want to hold on to the illusion that our parents loved us when the child inside of us feels like the parent didn't love us. And the only way the child is ever going to get rid of this emotion is to actually feel the truth that it feels, and that is that the parent didn't love us. Whether, and th the problem is, is when we have our own children, we then realise that maybe our parents did love us, <laughs> they just didn't know what to do. And so then we start justifying to our own inner child why it feels so unloved. Does that make sense? And in the process of justifying, rather than allowing the child to tell its truth, we actually deny the underlying causal emotion, which means we carry the causal emotion around within us. So we need to allow the child inside of us, the inner child inside of us, that's locked up in its grief. Remember I've said in the emotional processing work that every emotion that's suppressed inside of you is also locked up at the age it was suppressed. So if you had, a if you had an emotion locked up where you were in you when you were two, then the emotion is going to feel like a two-year-old emotion when you experience it. If you had an emotion locked up in you when you were four, then the emotion will be like a four-year-old person experiencing that emotion. So the four-year-old or the two-year-old or whatever age it is inside of us that we received a lot of this damage, this emotional damage from our parents, has its belief systems. And the big issue that most of us uh, have as adults is we don't allow that child to actually feel its belief systems. What we do instead is we're like a big adult telling the child what it should feel instead. Do you follow me? And that is what prevents a lot of this childhood or childlike emotion from flowing out of us. And this is something that you do quite strongly to yourself, Lisa, is that you, you quite often suppress 
the child's feelings that it has towards mummy or daddy inside of yourself, your own, you know, your own inner child feeling that you have towards mum or dad, you quite often suppress that quite strongly and, and that's what creates your law of attraction. If you could just allow the child to actually experience the emotion, then you would actually release it quite, str quite well because you are able to process your emotions very well. It's just that you're not allowing it to naturally occur because you've got yourself as an adult telling yourself inside how everything is all right really when you know it's not. Do you know what I mean? And if you can allow that to occur, you'll find the emotions will flow really easily. Yeah. And was there a... I'm going to come down the front to here, just across here, Peter. Um, it's all right. I've got the I'm nervous now. <laughs> That's okay, be nervous. Um, okay, so I have a problem where I have this blockage to do with what I want to actually do. I have millions of thoughts about all the millions of things that I'm interested in. and um, But yeah, I have this major blockage as to actually doing them. Um, except over the last couple of months I've been doing more stuff that I enjoy. But I still have a... Uh, like um, yeah, that massive blockage. I was just wondering what you suggest for me. I know there's obviously um, the causal emotions that I'm not dealing with, so there's that. But how do I look at what they might actually be? Can you look at why you're blocked? Can you feel why you're blocked? Maybe because I don't feel I deserve to do the things that I want to do. So there's a, there's a big emotion just in that block. Can you see that? Can you feel how that's been with you for a long time? Yeah. So the key for you is just allow yourself now to feel... I, the reason why I'm stopping myself from feeling my desires is because I feel like I don't deserve these desires. So somebody has to have told you this message some, at some point. So what made you feel like you don't deserve to have your desires? I'm not sure. Maybe just the people around me, my parents maybe, um, friends. I'm not sure. What do they do when you have them? Maybe criticise what I am interested in. Um, or tell me that I can't do it that I won't be able to um, achieve my goal. Yep. So these are false beliefs that are, that are emotions inside of you. That's why you feel so blocked. So the key is now to pray about the, ha allowing those emotions to come out of you. And you will actually connect to some childhood events, I feel, related to those particular messages that you just said about yourself. And when you connect to those, you, you'll feel quite differently afterwards. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No worries. Your choice. Your choice. <laughs> Mary's choice now, so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, AJ, your answer to uh, Raya um, started to relate some things to, to things that are happening in me. Quite some weeks ago, I, I had a, a similar experience of being uh, physically wiped out for a few days. So I can see now that there was a my, my body was recovering from, from what you say. Um, about a week before the last meeting in Brisbane, I had a, a somewhat different experience. Again, I was, I was wiped out for a shorter period and there was some deep stuff going on. When I came out of that, um, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I was meant to be doing. Um, if my mind started to think there was pain in the, the brain, um, Looking back on it, I, it was like a, a chaotic space. It was like a, a broken up, chaotic, disintegrated space that, that I was sensing myself as. Mm -hmm. And um, I started to get this feeling before yesterday's talk and it was quite strong at the end. The thing that you said yesterday which really hit me was that uh, you were talking about your identity as Jesus and Klaus's identity as Klaus. And, and then he looked, you looked at us and you said that um, many of you don't really 
have not yet really experienced who you truly are. Mm. And I'm beginning to feel that maybe somewhere in that chaotic space there was a sense of the me that is longing to emerge. Mm. So um, perhaps that recovery period had to do with uh, not a uh, not physical body but, but perhaps mental spiritual recovery. Yes. Or a lot of times these periods of uh, confusion will occur when you're on the divine love path. And in fact, your periods of intellectual confusion will grow um, until you're at the point of at one moment. You're getting the names of things, <laughs> like that right? thing. Yeah. Oh, the scissors. Okay. <laughs> if you learnt anything in an intellectual way, which is the way that the majority of us have learnt everything that we know, um, then those things will feel to a degree lost to us and we'll feel like we can't remember them anymore. We will remember them, but because the soul is becoming more and more dominant, we, we, the, so, the soul is not driving those things any, uh, you know, because it's the mind that was driving it. Before we were intellectually dominant, and so of course we, we feel quite safe in that space. But when the mind, remember the whole process of becoming at one with God is about the soul also becoming your dominant thing. In fact, the transition in the seventh sphere is that you actually lose your intellectual mind altogether. Right? So, so what actually happens is your so-called intellectual mind is lost in, the, in its dominance altogether. It still is there, but now it's only used as an as a, as a apparatus of the soul. And so the transition into at one moment, the intellectual mind is lost completely, if you like, and you now are totally in soul 100% of the time, and the mind is just used as one of the mechanisms by which the soul expresses itself. Now, of course, that transition is a pretty big transition. So you're going from this transition of having the mind as being the only thing that dominates you into the mind as being like having no effect on your life whatsoever aside from being a tool that you use. Now, that transition is such a large transition that you will actually go through periods of intellectual confusion coming to this state. And the key is just to allow those periods of intellectual confusion to occur and everything will right itself and all of a sudden afterwards, generally you'll have more clarity, but it will be a different type of clarity. It will be coming from your soul and not from your mind. And the key is just to allow these transitions to occur. What I've seen happen in many cases is a person has one or two of these transitions. And by the way, these transitions occur in every transition in every sphere as well. So, so I've seen a person have one or two of these transitions occur. They get so upset about them and so <coughs> confused about them that they just stop the whole emotional processing process altogether. My suggestion is don't do that. My suggestion instead is just allow the changes to occur or just naturally. What you're actually doing is getting back to your childlike state. In the childlike state, you don't think about what you're going to do next. You just do what you do next. <laughs> you, don't, you don't think about whether you should have this feeling or not. You just have the feeling. You don't think about what you desire or not. You just do what you desire if you're allowed to. <laughs> right? And when I say allowed to, as long as everyone around you allows you, you'll do it. Right? You, won't, uh, you won't stop that. And as an adult, of course, it wouldn't, you won't even care whether everyone allows you, who is allowing you or not, even, in that state. So what you're doing is you're making this transition between mind dominance and soul dominance. And that transition is going to feel quite confusing at times. And it's going to trigger you quite a lot in terms of you wanting to maintain intellect to maintain safety. And so the key is just to allow that to occur that process to occur. Yeah, I, sometime after this I, 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 I had the, the feeling that I didn't want to try to recreate what I was before, I just want to let them... Exactly. And also there was a feeling, I think, just after this that, um, you know, I've been praying a lot and, and, and praying for connection with, with my principal guide and... Yep. There were periods of like many minutes, several times, where I was moving around and I, I felt God connected to me. I felt my, mm -hmm. my guides around me. Yep. It was, uh, and it was as though there was this little group sort of moving around as yeah. one thing. That's it. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah. Okay. And those, those moments will grow into longer periods of time. That's what happens in the transitions that occur. So the key is just to allow these transitions to occur. Um, they're good signs that you're working through causal emotion uh, when you go through these periods of intellectual confusion. Yeah. So, you know, on any natural love path, intellectual confusion is looked down upon, right? <laughs> if you're intellectually confused, then, then obviously something's wrong, you know. In the divine love path, if you're intellectually confused, what's happening is your mind is actually releasing its dominance and your soul's now starting to take over. And you'll get to the state where your soul can, has completely taken over, which means that you'll be just like a child in all your actions. And your mind just... But you're an adult in the sense that you're a grown-up but, uh, and a lot of your adult, uh, desires are adult-like desires, but you'll be like a child in experiencing them, expressing them, and so forth. You won't have to think about it, even. Just like I don't think about most of the things I say to you. Yeah. I'll see you. <laughs> um, Carol, if we... Ajay, in the uh, book, The Gate of Heaven, there is an area when he's going into that new birth but isn't quite there, yes. where there is a spirit in her sleep state there. Yes. Now, how come she's up there? Like, do we go to those levels in our sleep state when you say that on earth we're not to that level? Many, many of you have received enough divine love to be in a certain state but the emotional injuries in your awake state are preventing you from living it in your awake state. So what that means is that for many of you, many of you have, might have had some dreams, for example, where you've been teaching with me or something like that in the sleep state. I know that many of you have had these kind of thing, experiences. But in your awake state, you wake up and think, how did that happen? Like, I don't feel like I'm ready to do that here. And that's because there are sleep, groups of sleep state emotions and then there's groups of awake state emotions that influence our development. So the key for you, for, for us all, is to make, sh make sure that we actually deal with our awake state emotions in the awake state. And as we do that, we'll get closer to that sleep state experience in our awake state. So the lady that you mentioned, she has received enough love in her, in her real soul condition to be in the state of transitioning between the seventh and the eighth sphere. Mm -hmm. But because she's, not, she's living on earth and not dealing with those emotions in her awake state, she was like still in her second sphere state. And the problem with passing is that when you pass with the emotions from your awake state, undealt with, they also now become your spirit state. So in other words, you take them with you. And so, so when this lady passed, she passed into the second sphere um, and she still had to deal with those groups of emotions. She didn't lose the divine love, obviously. Um, she had the emotions to deal with still. Yeah. Okay. Um, who were you going to choose? James. James wanted to ask a question, did you? James? James? Hey, Jay. Um, I've always been rather resistant to the concept of the inner child and from a thinking state thought it was like a process of, of division or separating us rather than a unifying process and yes. uh, as you were talking about the inner child before I began to feel really irritated mm -hmm. and I felt irritated by, by this before in work I was doing with Millie and when she was wanting to get me in touch with an inner child. And yeah. But my irritation changed to a, a totally different f a heart feeling. And um, I, I don't know what my question is. I, I, th I think I answer my own question, but I'm sick of not asking the questions I've already answered. And I want to change Well, that. perhaps I'd like to illustrate a little bit more about the inner child. Right? And I think what you're feeling is you'd like to know sort of more about this sort of inner child thing. And, what actually, uh, the thing to remember is that every emotion that is, un, that is unexperienced is locked up inside of you at the age it wasn't experienced. So that means that every single emotion has a certain experience in terms of age. Now often the emotion was very similar for a certain age. So for example, let's say when I was three years of age I first had these feelings that mummy and daddy didn't care for me. 
right? So at that point, I've got an emotion now locked up. Mummy and Daddy don't, don't care for me. Now, every time Mummy and Daddy demonstrate they don't care for me, that particular emotional set, which was created when I was three years of age, will receive that emotion. So when I'm six and Mummy and Dad don't care for me, the three-year-old receives that. When I was eight and Mum and Dad didn't care for me, the three-year-old receives that. Does that make sense? Because the three-year-old has been conditioned to receive that particular emotion. But let's say when I was five, my father abused me sexually. Right? Then anything to do with sexuality, the five-year-old will receive. Does that make sense? And so lots of these sexual-based emotions that start appearing when I'm nine, ten, into my teenage years, will go through and be reflected through that five-year-old who has been, who was the first person to experience a locking up of sexual abuse type emotions. And so what we finish up with is this situation within us where we do have seeming fragments of ourselves locked up inside of us emotionally. They are not different parts of you unless they are spirit attachments. So for many of us, we do have spirit attachments which feel like different ages too. And they are actual physical spirits attached to us that were attached to us at that age due to the event we experienced at that age. So I'm not talking about those. I'm talking specifically about our own personal emotions. Now our own personal emotions then, when we go back to experience them, will be locked up at the age experience. And so it will be like almost that I'm talking to the three-year-old inside of me. Now the whole goal of emotional processing in terms of once you become at one with God, of course what you need to also become is at one with yourself. Which means that all of these fragments at the time of the transition into the new birth will not be a part of you. The only way that they're ever going to be integrated into being a part of you is for you, the adult you, if you like, to accept all of their emotions rather than suppressing their emotions. So that actually means visiting your three-year-old, for example, who felt that mummy and daddy didn't love him and actually experiencing that emotion fully that mummy and dad didn't love me. And then ex visiting the five-year-old, if you like, who was sexually abused and, and experiencing the emotions of the sexual abuse that were locked down and, avo and avoided at that time. Does that make sense? Now, as that happens, the process of integration occurs. We become whole again. And in, so instead of viewing yourself as being fragments, you will actually feel yourself as being one individual. And, in, and of course you need to be one individual when you make the transition of a one man. That's where you will be. But the problem is as adults is we are constantly trying to avoid the fragments within us generally because that's our castle of pain that we talked about yesterday. And so in, in the process of avoiding them, we avoid connecting to the inner child. And so every single one of you who feel annoyed at a concept of inner child is actually got some inner child work to do. Yeah, I was going to say that um, for myself. I'd done inner child work before as well, earlier in my life, before I met AJ. And when this inner child stuff came up again, I was like, yeah, yeah, I've done it. And I'm, I was quite irritated as well. And until I really connected to the fact that I have this really bossy Mary person dragging around her little, <laughs> her little girl going... Because I, I was telling myself all this intellectual stuff, no, I can connect to what that felt like or what that felt like, until I really felt like, what if I was looking after that little girl? What if I wanted to give that little girl a voice? And then suddenly, all, like, if I imagine, like, if I imagine there's a... a I just did it in my imagination. If I imagine there's a little girl who experienced what I know happened, then suddenly all of this emotion just started coming up out of me. So I do. I I have different names and stuff now for different parts of me, which is something that really bothered me in the beginning. I thought, oh, that's a bit. Um, but it really helps me access emotion. Yeah. So for for Mary now, she the person who's handled a lot of the first century emotional experience. We, we call Maggie and, and so um, and what's happening is Maggie is slowly becoming Mary if you like uh, or Mary is slowly becoming Maggie like so what's happening is a process of integration and that same process occurred with myself so I had all of this first century life and all this pain from first century life that I had to experience in a very childlike way and allow the integration of myself to to, re to come about and and so now 
there's a, I can still occasionally feel sort of a little me that still hurt in some areas, but the majority of the times I don't feel that anymore. But that's taken quite a few years of emotional processing to do that. Thank you. Can, can I just share another question here? Because this mm -hmm. is um, about the same thing. It's a good question. Uh, inner child emotions. That's the thing, though. I don't know where my soul is in all this or who it is. Uh, maybe we've answered it. But feelings and aspirations, etc. I'm not sure if what I feel is real or just a covering feeling. Your comment that if it is, child, if it is a childlike feeling, then it's a soul feeling was very helpful. But then I'm reminded of the times when I have blurted out something and assumed this is straight from the soul and he had repercussions where I learned that if at all possible, I should keep my thoughts to myself. And even when I look carefully at what I've said, I can't see that there was any intended unki unkindness at all. So I feel aware of this inner child that feels very repressed by my older child, but I can't understand when the inner child pops out that it doesn't lead to freedom and happiness, so to speak. So a lot of us feel this, actually, where, you know, I'm trying to encourage you to live in truth, for example. Your inner ch ch child knew how to live in truth. Like, when you were little, you knew how to live in truth. You know, you were next door, you know, four years of age, playing with a next-door neighbour, and then you hear next-door neighbour's mummy say, oh, you know, something about your mummy, like, really nasty about your mummy. You go home and you just tell her. Like, you don't cover it up or anything, <laughs> do you? And then when you hear your daddy say something about the next-door neighbour's mummy, you know, <laughs> you don't care about covering that up either. You, know, you just go and tell the next-door neighbour's mummy what daddy said about it, right? And, of course, what happened then? <laughs> and lots of, yeah, hell, all hell broke at least then, right? And so, and so what, ha what happens is that uh, th at the core level, we knew how to live in truth. And th that got really badly damaged. So what we do when we start to go back to living in truth, what are we going to do? We're starting to confront everyone around us. All of our environment is going to be confronted with this truth. And then for many of those people are going to desire to punish us for that truth which is in fact, you know, helping us to get to some other causal emotion within ourselves. We need to actually allow that to occur till we get to the point where we love the truth so much that it doesn't matter what happens to us. We just want to live in truth. So whether I die, living in truth wouldn't matter to me in that state. It doesn't matter. That's the state we need to get to be into. But to get to be into that state, we need to be very, very close to the child we were. Because the child was in that state before it got punished and before it got hurt, right? Yeah, and for me, with, my, with, say, Maggie and Mary, Mary's run my whole adult life, um, or most of my entire life, and she moderates Maggie very, very well. But that just gets me into loads of trouble because um, if I just let Maggie have her voice, even if at times it's angry or upset, it's only through that process of letting all of that emotion out that she's going to heal. Mm. Um, but Mary always has these very strong ideas about you can't do this or you can't do that, and you have to do that in a different way. Mm. And what Mary just brought up there is a very important point. We're often trying to control these little inner voices that feel quite differently by this adult self trying to keep everything intact, you know, keep everything under control. And the problem with that process is we're not understanding at the soul level yet one basic truth, and that is all of these emotions are emotions that are locked up inside of us that we're carrying around permanently that's creating our law of attraction that also prevents our relationship with God. Right? So while I'm dominating my inner child with this adult-like you know, adult structure, what I'm actually doing is preventing my own personal integration, my own personal at-one with myself, and preventing the process of at-one with God. Um, I, I have been... Um talking to my inner child, her name is Moi Moi, um, and she's three years of age. Mm -hmm. um, I had, um, I went through a process uh, with Millie and uh, I felt a lot of terror. And the terror was that I wouldn't feel my emotions. Um, it was then after that I s uh, was talking to Moi Moi because um, 
there's a couple of questions I have to ask about Moi Moi is that when I was three, I can remember um, uh, standing in front of a mirror, long mirror in the cupboard, and telling myself never to be happy. Never to expect anything. Um, so that I could avoid the pain that I was experiencing through my mother. Um, so when I found my boy again, she was uh, all bent over and <coughs> didn't want to talk to me and I couldn't touch her at first. Um, but when I did get to her a bit closer, after I experienced uh, a few more things, um, I went out, I had a, a very uh, a deep uh, emotional something uh, to do with the terror the night before and then I, I got up to express a bit more rage and I uh, went up and I started but I was very tired uh, but normally she wanted to keep going and and I said, oh, I can't do this because I physically was too tired. Yeah. And I said, you go for it. And she kept going on. And I don't know how much is this in my head, but I felt she was carrying on and raging. And, yeah. and then she went into the state where she was playing on a swing, like a round thing. Yeah. And um, she... She's having so much fun. I said, no, we've got to do some emotional work now. <laughs> She'd already just done it. Yeah. <laughs> so she didn't want to. Yeah. And, and anyway, I, I, I said, okay. Um, I spoke to my spirit guide and I said, she's not talking to me. Can you ask her what I can do <laughs> to, to, to um, you know, help me with this? And she said, um, she told the spirit guide that... Uh, uh, because everything stopped at three, I never experienced any joy from that moment. Yeah. So, but I said, oh, but I've been playing on the gym and everything since then. I remember I was at school. Yeah. She says, yeah, you played, but you weren't in joy. Yeah. And uh, so I let her play. I just said, okay, go, go play, because yeah. I don't know how to play. Yeah. And uh, so after that, what happened was that I wanted to go into some sort of emotional processing, trying to go further into it since I had already felt so much. But I couldn't feel anything. It was like, I can't reach it. Um, yeah. I, I can't feel anything. And it was like I was numb. Yeah. Um, then I went down and I did experience something. I, I happened to, in the process at Millie's stand, with two feet in some dog poo. And I've been getting these signs all along, dogs poo there and cat poo there, and, and they were getting closer and closer, but this time I had two feet in it. <laughs> and I didn't at first register what that meant, but I, because I was feeling something, I just went down feeling like shit, and that's what I thought. My whole life was shit. Yeah. And that's when I started beating up things and feeling the shit. Yeah. And after I did that and howled and, and I found a perfect spot for it because yeah. I got rid of the thing about where to do it. Yeah. So the thing was that after that, I couldn't get to the further emotion. And I woke up this morning and um, <laughs> I remember you saying that Promiscuous people tend to have no feeling. That's why they do what they do. And I know, I know about the sexual shame. And, um, and my question was, was the feeling feeling nothing? Is it worse than feeling like shit? Because I always felt like I felt like shit. But I'm not sure if feeling like nothing is worse. Mm. Yeah. 
There's a lot of things going on for you, and it's really, really good that you're accessing them now. Um, what's going on is this integration process of what you've locked up inside of yourself at different ages. The reason, w at some, the problem is that the adult you has a lot of judgment about what happened to the child you, and the adult you is actually limiting the child's expression of what happened to itself. So you limit it in a number of ways. Firstly, you the adult you I'm talking, not the child, the adult. You, you can learn a lot from your inner child, right? Um, the adult you is limiting her in, in, in this way of, her, the way of experiencing joy. You made this choice to not experience joy anymore, which detuned you a lot from the process of enjoying things. So you do things thinking you enjoy them, but in reality there's not the heartfelt joy that you get out of it. Also what happens is you know that many of these events that affected you when you were little were sexual in nature, which create sexual shame inside of yourself. Well, you will as you work through your terror. And, and what happens is that that sexual shame, as the adult has a lot of judgment about that sexual shame, although has acted in it, has a lot of judgment about it. So there's a lot of emotions about the integration sexually that needs to occur. So what often happens, because many of our inner child emotional fragments, if we could call it that, the emotional fragments locked up or frozen in time, are related to our development in all sorts of ways. They're related to our identity, they're related to our sexual identity, they're related to different emotions at different time periods that relate to different experiences that we had. And because it all is happening during our developmental years, we often have very, very strong fragments in our nature, particularly when it comes to sexual issues, but also when it comes to experiencing joy, as a child would experience it. And so we end up with this quite strong fragments that don't talk to each other. In other words, we keep them very, very apart from each other. So, for instance, you might have an inner child that has been abused sexually, and you might have an inner child that has, been, that, that has experienced some joy, and you might have an inner child that actually was cuddled by mum, and you might, do you know what I mean? And none of them want to talk to each other because none of them want to face the truth that of the other, the other one's truth. And that all comes from, usually, this adult desire to avoid emotion. So the adult desire to avoid the emotion creates these, the, main, the, maintain, the maintenance of these fragments. So the key thing for us to do is to actually start as an adult, start relaxing the judgment. Mary once said to me that her Mary is angelic in nature, sitting on one shoulder, like if you can imagine that, and that her Maggie was evil in nature sitting on the other shoulder. And I actually said, well, actually, I don't feel that's true. In fact, if anything, the Mary that you feel is angelic in nature is actually quite further away from God than the Maggie you feel that is evil in nature. Because the Mary who was dominant in nature was actually domineering and suppressing emotion, was preventing the expression of emotion that would draw, draw Mary closer to God. And, and preventing the truth from coming out, preventing her Mary from living in truth. Does that make sense? And had a lot of judgment. And had a lot of judgment yeah. as well. And judgment itself is a, is a very, uh, it's totally the opposite to forgiveness, um, which is something you know, that a person who's angelic in nature would practice. So actually the person that we believe is the angel often is exactly the opposite in a way. And the person we believe is the evil one is often exactly the opposite in that, in that they're closer to God. My viewpoint is there's no angel or devil in this, but in fact there's all just these frozen emotions and we have a lot of judgments about them and the adult needs to lessen the judgments about them. So as you, as an adult, release these judgments that you have about what happened during your life and also what happened as a child, and allow the child, this childlike expression of joy and the childlike expression of anger and the childlike expression of all these different things that are locked up, what happens is the two of you communicate more and more and more and more until you become one. And that's what will happen for yourself. The key is just to allow this process to occur. 
you're, you're, you're doing really well with it and uh, you just need to allow this process of integration to occur. Try though to not maintain separation. So for example, if the inner child wants to do something like bash the hell out of a bag, the adult needs to learn to cooperate and bash the hell out of the bag no matter how tired the adult is. Does that make sense? Because the adult is just using an excuse to help the inner child avoid the emotion. Now sometimes our inner child is far stronger than the adult part of us. <coughs> and when I say far stronger, they are, total, they are totally capable of experiencing all their emotions in a far more s smooth and realistic manner than we can as an adult. Because we, we, you're so used to suppressing our emotion as an adult. So if you just go along with the inner child's desire, so like, you know, I go and have a swing on a swing when I want to have a swing on a swing. Many people laugh at me. I've got a trampoline in my backyard. And I go and... Oh, is it? Um, I've got a trampoline in my backyard. Yeah, my battery's out. My battery's out. I've lost all energy. Um, I've got a trampoline in my backyard and I go and do somersaults on it, like... And I'm 46 years of age. Like when people see me doing that, they think I'm an idiot. But, but I, you know, this is this is part of me just being how I feel, you know. And so what happens is that um, you'll eventually connect to all these facets of yourself, but also all of these facets of self will join up together. And when they join up together, then you'll know you're whole, and you'll feel really you'll feel whole, and you won't feel like you're very fragmented at all. So just allow that to happen, but allow your inner child to guide it. Does that make sense? And what you've been doing is great. When you don't talk to her very well, help your spirit guides to talk with her and all that kind of stuff. That's really, really good because that is part of this joining process. But stop resisting it as the adult. Many of us as the adult resist these childhood emotions. So this is what we've got to stop doing. Stop resisting these childhood emotions as the adult. Allow the child to experience the emotion and then as an adult just be the observer. Allow these experiences to occur. Does that make sense? Then could I ask that I haven't been able to feel anything in the last week or so and whether that was the adult trying to dominate it? Yes. So how would I, I didn't know how to go back, would I you, you need to look at the emotional reason you have as to why, as an adult, you want to dominate. And there is some issues of control in there yeah. that you need to pray about, like yeah. self-control, controlling yourself. Uh. And you need to pray about those issues because in the end we need to release this desire to control the process. What was happening is that everything was starting to feel quite uh, scary inside for a while there for the adult, not the child. The child was perfectly happy. Oh, okay to go and swing on the swing when yeah. it wants to, have a rage when it wants to, and punch the bag when it wants to, right? The child was perfectly happy with that. But you as the adult, you're not so happy with that because uh -huh. that doesn't look reasonable, feels a bit crazy, feels like you're going a bit nuts at times and so forth, right? Yeah. And so what the adult starts to do is the adult starts to, you know, try to force the child back into its box again. So, so that was a self-deception because I thought yes. I wasn't... Yep. Uh, okay. So the key is to look at the emotional reason why the adult wants to do that. Does it, you follow me? Yeah. So what's going on inside of you as the adult that you can't allow a child to experience its emotions? Then w what I keep asking myself is, what is that self-deception that I'm going through? Because I keep feeling that I want to, mm -hmm. and I try to find ways where if I feel shy about doing it I find places and I go places and I do things and I read books or I don't read books or I re look at me I do anything to try and get to it yeah. even sit there and just but, but there's a capping emotion yeah and the capping emotion is the emotion firstly of your own judgment of yourself oh, doing it's it judgment that I think. but secondly you have a deep capping emotion of of how will other people th if other people see me doing this yeah what are they going to think of me yeah. Right? And those are two capping emotions that you need to allow yourself to explore and pray about. Yeah, because um, my daughter um, finds it really terrible. Yeah, and that's the reflection of one of those capping emotions, oh, okay. the judgment from others. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Right. Once you release that, your daughter will f be fine with the process. In fact, she'll probably start doing it herself. 
right, thank you very yeah. much. I have to go to the loo. <laughs> and Mary has to go to the loo too. So it's, it's five to three. So, so probably what we'll do at this point is have a break. And if we could come back about, say, quarter to four, something like that, that'd be good.